I told you last hour that I would tell you about my uh, trip to Kenny Bunkport this weekend. And uh, people say, Kenny Bunkport, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Kenny Bunkport? For me? Yeah. Uh, it's a political area and lobster. <laughs> it's uh, down east in Maine on the ocean there, on the Atlantic Ocean. And it's known uh, because there's a place there called Walker's Point, and that's where the Bush family has uh, lived in the summertime for years and years and years. And uh, it's a quaint little New England town, quintessential, if you would, a lobster town, as you say, indeed, and a kind of a vacation spot, very, very charming place. So um, this is not a political story. I've got to tell you that right up front because I don't take political sides on the program. I just want to tell you this little story about what happened to me there this weekend. When I was 12 years old, believe it or not, I was flipping through the channels, and I ran across an infomercial for George Bush. At the time, he was running for the Republican nomination against Ronald Reagan. And just being 12 years old, I kind of liked what he had to say. I thought he was pretty nice. And uh, I thought about his credentials, you know, the fact that he had been the uh, UN ambassador, the head of the CIA, he'd been the envoy to China, and uh, seemed pretty capable. And I thought, I bet you that guy would make a pretty good president. Well, as we know, Reagan won the nomination and decided to make George Bush his uh, running mate, and they were elected, president and vice president. So for eight years, as a young person, I watched George Bush serve as a loyal and capable vice president, even had a sense of humor about it all. But I liked the, the way that he never crossed Reagan. He was always loyal, and even when it came time for him to become his own man and run for president, you know, he was respect, respectful to President Reagan. So then I'm 20 years old, and it comes time for George Bush to run on his own. And I went to the uh, Wyandotte Fourth of July parade, the biggest Fourth of July parade in the state of Michigan. And here came Vice President Bush, who came, obviously, he was campaigning, and he was in the parade. And he came by the rope line, and he shook my hand, and he shook a lot of people's hands. And the band, I'll never forget, was playing the song, So Glad You Made It. And the president it was exciting. And I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to get involved in this. So, believe it or not, I volunteered to be an advance volunteer any time the vice president came to Michigan. And he came very often because it was a battleground state. And at the age of 20, they checked out my security. I guess I was fine. They let me be a motorcade driver in the, in the uh, vice presidential visits. So I would drive the third van behind the limousine. Can you imagine what a thrill that was at 20 years old? I would pull up next to Air Force One. We would wait. Air Force Two, because he was the vice president, down the steps he would come and get in the limo, and off we would go. And very often I would have senior staff from his campaign in the back of the van while I'm driving, sometimes 45 minutes to Southfield or wherever it was from Detroit Airport. And uh, they probably thought I was some, you know, dim kid driving the van, but I was soaking up everything they said because they would talk strategy and politics and the campaign. And I remember having uh, James Baker III and Lee Atwater one time for 45 minutes listening to them while, uh, while I drove them. And it was really very, very fascinating to me. So I did that. And being an advanced volunteer, I had a couple of opportunities to, you know, be around George Bush, shake his hand, that kind of thing. And Heinz Prechter, if you'll remember, he invented the sunroof. He was from the downriver area of Detroit, and so was I. So I was working for J.P. McCarthy at the time, and he was uh, supportive of me because I was from his hometown and he invited me to an event with the president and that kind of thing. So I got to meet him a few times, just like anybody else would. Nothing special. Uh, eventually, though, uh, as, the, as the story kind of goes on, I had an opportunity to write a book with uh, President Bush after he left office and it was uh, having to do with the PGA Tour and a project he was working on with life skills for young kids. And uh, I pitched it to the PGA Tour. Initially, the president liked the idea, and we were going to collaborate on this book. And then his son decided to run for president, and he got a little busy and, and didn't want to commit the time, which was perfectly fine. But if you come to our downtown studio here, our storefront studio, you'll see a couple of letters that I got from George Bush, and they're framed on the wall in here. And I hope you will sometime. We're a couple blocks from the Capitol, right on the street. And uh, in, that, in the letter, you'll see that I, I had sent the president some of the other books that I'd written. Uh, and I usually always got a note back. And in one of the cases, he wanted me to sign the book, so he sent back book plates. And he said, we like this book so much, it's going in our collection. Would you please autograph the book plates so I can put them in there because it's a signed collection? And I thought, wow, I got a letter from the former president of the United States asking me to autograph a book that I'd written that he 
cherished enough to do that. It was pretty neat, all right? I just uh, I thought it was fun. So then, you know, after this sort of pen pal thing went on, uh, I hadn't I'd been around him for a long time, and I went this weekend to Kenny Bunkport. And uh, played at his played golf at his golf club, Cape Arundel Golf Club there, where Ken Rayner is the head professional. And I've been in touch with him lots of times. I've used him for golf stories and things like that. And uh, Ken said that he'd been with the president the night before. And I said, you know, I usually mail my book to him down in Houston. Would you mind handing it to him personally? He said, I'd be happy to do that. So he was going to see the president the next day, and he was going to hand him my book with a little handwritten note. And I, that's, a, that's a gas for me because... Uh, you know, the president's a golf fan, obviously, and I, I know that uh, he's going to get that book. So sure enough, I'm excited by all that. Sunday morning in Kenny Bunkport, uh, my wife Christine and I went to St. Anne's for Mass at 8 o'clock. And they have it outside, if you can believe how gorgeous this is. There's a small peninsula, a grassy little peninsula that sticks out into the ocean. And there's a stone altar at the front of it. And so it was a placid morning on the Atlantic Ocean. And the sky was beautiful and the air was clean. And we walked in there like just about three minutes before 8 o'clock in the morning for the service. And it was a small congregation. There was probably, I don't know, 80 people maybe, maybe less. And, um, and there are benches. And so I said, well, where are we going to sit? Where are we going to sit? Well, there's space in the front. So we went and sat in the front row. And seconds before the service, in comes... Mrs. Bush and some members of their family and President Bush himself, and they sat down in the front row, you know, five steps from me. And if you can imagine this gorgeous morning and President Bush, the man who served his country in the manner that he did, sitting that close, and the opening song is My Country Tis of Thee. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, this is a moment that I will never, ever, ever forget, uh, to stand there and worship with Mr. and Mrs. Bush and sing My Country Tis of Thee in Kenny Bunkport, their hometown. And uh, I, they were both radiant. Obviously, he's, you know, in his late 80s, so he's starting to show his age. He walks with a cane and gets a little help, you know, here and there to move around. But uh, I, I wish I could, uh, you know, and I had a camera in my pocket, but I wouldn't dare take it out in a situation <laughs> like that. But the moment was golden, you know what I mean? I mean, there he was in the same pew as me, uh, just, um, I don't know how to describe to you uh, how meaningful that was to me after all these years. When, he, when you know, I was 12 years old the first time uh, he came into my consciousness, and then to sit there and be able to worship with him in that kind of environment was overwhelming to me, and I'll never forget it. It was an absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, after the after the service, he goes straight to the boat. We stayed in a in a house that was uh, right across the cove, right across the street, essentially from his home at Walker's Point. So when we got back to the house. He had obviously gone back to his house, and he hopped in this uh, big, huge cigarette boat. Fidelity 4 is what it's called, and it must be 50, 60 feet long. And the other members of the family climbed in. And then he guns that thing and cruising speed about 50 miles an hour out into the Atlantic for a Sunday morning ride. And so, it, But the point is, if you ever go to Kenny Bunkport, you'll see what I mean. It's a quaint little place, and uh, you'll see the bushes uh, you know, riding around in the boat or maybe in restaurants and that kind of thing. And I just thought... I thought I'd share that story with you because those are the kind of golden moments that you have in life if you, if you show up from time to time. And um, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have had that kind of exposure to, to President Bush. And um, I'll never forget it. It's an amazing story. Can you story. imagine sitting in the front pew? I, I can't imagine it. It uh, must be a once-in-a-lifetime. Yeah, what am I doing in the front pew at a church anyway? <laughs> probably, I should, probably should be sitting in the back pew. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, so we'll get back to politics here, but I thought you'd like that story. And uh, it's.